Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for joining tonight. Um, my name is Amy, and I am the Outreach and Advocacy Coordinator at the Student Borrower Protection Center. Um, if we could just get some slides up, perhaps, um, we'll start the presentation. One moment. Sorry about that. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so welcome to our webinar on troubleshooting the PSLF waiver. So we'll talk about the PSLF program, how to access the current waiver, and some common issues that people have experienced um, pertaining to the waiver and how to address them. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the background of the Student Borrower Protection Center. We're a national nonprofit organization solely focused on alleviating the burden of student debt in this country. And we engage in a mix of advocacy, policy making, and litigation strategy to rein in industry abuses, protect borrowers' rights, and advance economic opportunity for the next generation of students. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, one note about questions. If you have questions, if you could throw them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, and one of my colleagues will be fielding some questions so that we can um, answer as many as possible tonight. Um, so let's to, to, so let's start. So to begin, um, we'll talk about the program as it was created and how it functioned until recently. So Congress created the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program in 2007 to help public service workers who are struggling with student loan debt um, and also to make sure that um, future students and graduates wouldn't be deterred from entering public service because of their student loan balances. And to put it simply, PSLF is the promise that if a borrower works in public service, and makes payments for 10 years, the remainder of that debt will be forgiven. But as you'll see, and if you're here, I'm sure you already know, um, it's a bit more complicated than that. So how does PSLF actually work? More than simply working in public service for 10 years, there are normally four specific criteria. So first you need to have a direct loan. That's one of several federal loan types. So only direct loans qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Um, and they've been the main loan since 2010. So if you took out a loan since then, it likely qualifies. But if you have an older loan, and they're sometimes called federal family education loans or FEL loans or a Perkins loan, um, those don't qualify. But you can consolidate them in order to qualify for PSLF. And we'll get to that later. Second, you need to be in the correct repayment plan, which for the program is generally an income-driven repayment plan. These plans go by names like income-based repayment or IBR, Income Contingent Repayment, or ICR, um, pay and repay. Third, you need to work in public service, which includes government organizations. So that covers most city, state, and federal employees, a 501c3 nonprofit, or certain other nonprofits. You also have to work full time, which is defined as 30 hours a week, or um, what your employer says is full time if it's greater than that. And the 30 hours can be with more than one employer if you have multiple jobs um, at different nonprofits or one at a government agency and one at a nonprofit. And then finally, um, the last requirement is that you need to make 120 qualifying payments, which is 10 years worth of payments. And the payments have to be made on time and in full. And if you leave public service and then you come back, you can continue accruing credits and you don't need to start over. So the payments don't have to be consecutive. Um, there have been some impacts of COVID on the, the, um, on the public service loan forgiveness program. First, for those loans getting the payment pause, those owned by the federal government, um, each month of suspended payments toward PSLF um, counts for loan forgiveness. They count for, for forgiveness towards PSLF. Um, however, if you still need, you still need to meet the other criteria. So the most relevant criteria is the public service employer. So now we'll talk a little bit about what has changed in the program and why. So the initial rejection rate was 99%. Only some 800 applications out of 90,000 were approved and folks were being denied because they had the wrong loan or they weren't in the right repayment plan or some other technical reason that had nothing to do with whether they actually did the 10 years of public service. And as you can imagine, um, this was a huge problem and an incredible failure for the public service employees that PSLF was meant to support. And many folks took out debt to get the education they needed um, to become teachers or government attorneys, um, specifically because they had been told that after 10 years of affordable payments, the remainder would be forgiven. But in the summer of 2021, um, the Department of Education for the first time ever opened a request for information um, and asked borrowers to tell them about their PSLF experience. 
So this was an opportunity for borrowers who had worked in public service for 10 years, but who were gonna get locked out of the program because of the bureaucratic program criteria or um, someone who had delayed retirement to get those extra qualifying payments to ask the Biden administration to fix the program once and for all. And nearly 50,000 people submitted comments um, sharing their experiences with PSLF and they all had a consistent message. The program wasn't working for those that it was meant for. And within weeks of the request for information period ending, the federal government announced a special waiver that would address um, many of the issues raised by borrowers who filed comments. So for a limited time, the Department of Education will retroactively grant credit towards um, PSLF loan forgiveness for borrowers um, for months that previously didn't count for the program, either because they had the wrong loan type or they weren't making the right payment. So we'll walk through these changes now. So essentially what the department's waiver does is give public service workers credit towards loan forgiveness, regardless of what type of federal loan um, they have, and for any period of time since October 1st, 2007, when the program began, um, and as long as they were in qualifying public service employment and their loan wasn't in default, deferment, or forbearance. And even for months in which borrowers did not actively make a payment, um, as long as the loan was in repayment status, they can receive credit. So these credits will be retroactive. So borrowers can receive credit for past payments um, that were previously ineligible. And in short, um, for any month since October 1st, 2007, that a borrower had any type of federal loan, worked for a qualifying public service employer, and wasn't in default, deferment, or forbearance, that borrower can receive credit towards the 120 months required for loan forgiveness under PSLF. Um, so however, this waiver isn't completely automatic. Normally, PSLF requires that borrowers have a specific loan type, direct loans, as I mentioned. And although the waiver allows borrowers with any loan type to get credit, those without direct loans must take some steps to convert their loans into direct loans through a process called consolidation. And almost all borrowers, regardless of loan types, will have to certify with the Department of Education any periods of qualifying public service work since October 1st, 2007. And the idea there is that if the government doesn't know that you have qualifying work, it can't award you the right credits. Um, is it possible to go to the next slide? Okay, perfect. Um, so importantly, the department's waiver only lasts until October 31st, 2022. That means that any borrower who must change their loan type through consolidation or certify their public service work with the department must do so before this deadline of October 31st, 2022. This doesn't mean that everyone will receive their new credit towards loan forgiveness by that deadline, just that the paperwork has to be completed. And credits will be given on a rolling basis, and the department may take more time beyond October 31st, 2022 to process everyone. Um, but if you get credits from the waiver, those credits are permanent. So if you did not receive enough to meet the 120 credit requirement, you can still continue to accrue more credits after October 31st, um, just adding to those that you've received during the waiver. So with that in mind, there are three things that all public service workers with federal loans should do. So to figure out how this special waiver applies to you and what steps you individually need to take, every borrower should do three things. We'll talk about each, but briefly they are to confirm your past and present employers are qualifying public service employers, determine your loan types and consolidate them if necessary, and then certify your employment. So first, you're going to confirm that you have a qualifying employer. Nothing about this requirement changed during the waiver. You still need to work in public service, except that during the waiver period, you don't still need to be employed at the time that you apply for forgiveness after your 120 payments. And remember that qualifying employers include any government employers, that's federal, state, local, or tribal, and any nonprofits that have a 501c3 tax exempt status. Certain other nonprofits also qualify. However, unions and political organizations do not, and nor do any for-profit employers. And if you aren't sure whether your employer qualifies as a public service employer for PSLF, the Department of Education um, maintains a list of qualifying public service employers that you can search. It's important to note though, that this list isn't necessarily exhaustive. So if your employer doesn't appear, but you still believe that you're a qualifying public service employer or that you work for a qualifying public service employer, you can still proceed with the process. Um, and you can access this list by using the PSLF help tool which is available at studentaid.gov. 
Um, the employer database is the first step in the help tool, so you can quickly access it to check your past and present employer status. Okay, um, step two. So what type of federal loans do you have? Um, the three major loan types that most folks today have are direct loans, federal family education loans, or FEL loans, and Perkins loans. For public service workers um, to get loan forgiveness for their FEL and Perkins loans under the PSLF waiver, they will have to consolidate, which is like a refinancing pro process. Um, they'll have to consolidate those loans into a direct loan. Remember what's special about the waiver is that normally when you consolidated your loans, you lost any past credit towards forgiveness, but during the waiver, you can keep that past credit and apply it to a new consolidated loan. Um, the final step that all public service workers with federal student loans should do is certify their qualifying employment with the Department of Education. Remember qualifying employers are any level of government, 501c3 nonprofit employers, and certain other nonprofit employers. The form to do this is called the PSLF form, but it was previously called an Employment Certification Form, or ECF. And borrowers should certify their employment using the PSLF help tool, which is the same tool they could use to confirm that their past and, pre or past and current employers qualify them for the PSLF. The tool will generate the form for you, which your employer will then have to sign. Okay, um, so we've just discussed the three steps borrowers should take if they um, to make sure that they benefit for the PSLF waiver. Now I'm gonna briefly show you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to do all this. Um, and we'll start with confirming that your employer is PSLF eligible. So you'll need to log in to studentaid.gov. And if you don't know your login information, there is a way to reset it and get access. You're gonna to wanna to hover over a manage loans located in the top toolbar and click on public service loan forgiveness in the drop-down menu. You'll see the PSLF help tool there, which you should click to launch. Um, here, borrowers can look up all of their employers since October 2007 in the help tool by entering their tax employer identification number or EIN and their dates of employment. You can check your employer's EIN um, by looking at your W-2, by asking your employer, or for some larger employers by Googling them. Um, if your employer appears when you run the search, your employer is a confirmed public service employer. So you should proceed to the next steps of checking your loan types or consolidating if necessary. If your employer doesn't appear, you could still be eligible as this list isn't exhaustive. It could mean that no one else from your agency or your nonprofit has sought um, PSLF in the past. So don't be discouraged if your employer doesn't pop up, um, especially if you work for a government agency or for a 501c3 nonprofit and you know that you're eligible. So some ineligible employers will show up. I'm sorry, some eligible employers will show up as ineligible. So once you've determined whether your employers are eligible, you should confirm what type of loans you have. And this can be really confusing and many folks don't necessarily know. Um, to see all of your federal loans, you should log into your online account again at studentaid.gov. Um, you'll have a dashboard there that lists all of your loans. And any that say direct loans or that say direct are direct loans and any that don't say direct will have to be consolidated. And for a more granular list, you can download your loan data. You can see on the slide um, how to navigate to your data. So once you download your data, it will look like this. You'll be able to tell what type of loans you have. Here you can see two screenshots of the data report. At the top, each says loan type and each says FEL for a federal family education loan. They don't say direct, so they'll have to be consolidated. Now on this report, you'll also see loans that have been paid off or already consolidated. You only need to confirm the ones with a balance because those are the ones that you're trying to consolidate and get forgiven. Now, if you have non-direct loans, you'll wanna consolidate them. So to consolidate your loans, you'll need to log into studentaid.gov again. Um, you'll hover over manage loans located in the top toolbar and then click on consolidate my loans in the drop-down menu. And then here you can access the, uh, consolidation application. It will then guide you through the steps you'll need to take, which includes selecting which loans you want to include in the consolidation, confirming the amount and rate of the new loan, and selecting your payment and servicer, and then signing for the loan. Here is a tip specific to the waiver. So if you have a mix of older and newer loans, some, so some would be closer to the 10 years um, needed for forgiveness under PSLF, if you consolidate all of the loans together, the new loan will be awarded as much credit towards forgiveness as your oldest existing loan. 
So if you consolidate old and new loans together, then the consolidated loan, when the consolidated loan is ultimately forgiven, the entire amount of the loan will be forgiven. This is useful for folks who have older fill loans, but also newer direct loans. You might not think to consolidate um, your direct loans because they're already uh, qualify, they already qualify, but if you do consolidate them, they could be forgiven on the timeline set by your older fell loans. Um, so remember that for the regular PSLF program, you need to be enrolled in an IDR plan. So when you're consolidating, it's a good idea to select one of the IDR plans as your payment plan. Um, some of the names for these plans include income-based repayment or IBR, income contingent repayment or ICR, pay and repay. Um, and then finally, let's just review how to certify your employment. So just like with confirming your employers, um, you'll need to log back in as, into studentaid.gov again, hover over manage loans, and then click on public service loan forgiveness in the drop-down menu. We're gonna go back to the PSLF help tool. So you'll remember this step from earlier. It was the first step in the help tool. Um, you can add your employers here, and then uh, the PSLF help tool will help guide borrowers through the next steps, including identify, and identifying which loans they wanna include for PSLF loan forgiveness. Once you complete each of the tool, the tool steps, it'll generate a form that you can use to certify your employment. Um, again, this form is called the PSLF form, and it was formerly called the Employment Certification Form. And it's the form that you'll need to submit to receive the benefits of the PSLF waiver. So once you have the PSLF form, You'll need to have your any employer that you're claiming as a public service employer sign that form. And once the form is signed, you must submit it to the designated federal student loan servicer for processing to make sure that you get the maximum benefit that you qualify for. And everyone must submit a new form um, that reflects all of their qualifying public service work by that deadline of October 31st, 2022, um, in order to benefit from the waiver. So, What's the process um, for getting forgiveness? So this is the general process for PSLF, but it applies for the waiver too. Um, so FIA operating as Fed Loan Servicing is currently the exclusive servicer for public service loan forgiveness. So borrowers seeking PSLF need to send the PSLF form to FIA, which will do a preliminary review of the loan eligibility. And if you have a qualifying loan, your loan will then be transferred to FIA for, process, or for servicing, at which point it will run through the other criteria um, such as employment and qualifying payments. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of problems with people finding out too late in the game that they thought they qualified, but they had something wrong. So for this reason, we advise that you submit a form as soon as you're interested in public service loan forgiveness, and then do it each year until you qualify for forgiveness. And also do it again every time you change public service employers. You don't have to do this. You could do it, um, you could document everything after 10 years, but this way you have a great chance of catching any issues that arise um, and dealing with them as they happen. Um, and PSLF, uh, I'm sorry, the Department of Education has stated that they're continuing to review PSLF cases on a rolling basis. So there's no exact timeline for when you'll receive notification um, from them. You might've read too that FedLoan is ending its contract with the Department of Education. And this is true. Um, and it was recently announced that another company is taking over. Um, at this point, it's okay uh, to still have everything go through Fed Loan Servicing because the tr transfer won't happen for a little while. And if anyone has to um, transfer accounts, um, that can, the companies can handle that. However, you should keep your own copy of all your records because sometimes things get lost from one company to another. Um, so now we'll talk about some of the common issues that borrowers have faced um, pertaining to the waiver and then how to address them. So when you submit your PSLF form or employment certification form, it's important that you make sure the form is easy to read. If your employer has written over or tried to correct things after signing the form, you should request a new clean application from them. Often, if anything is crossed out or written over, like in this picture, um, this form will be automatically rejected or the time you worked for this employer will not be counted with your other applications. Your application could be delayed or rejected if you submit this, this form as is, and uh, like with the scribbling from your employer. So requesting that they complete another form could save you a lot of time. Um, when, when borrowers complete the PSLF help tool, the form suggests that a borrower must take their loans out of administrative forbearance under the payment clause, stating the following after the subheading, get out of um, deferment or forbearance. This message is really confusing. 
So because student loans were placed into administrative forbearance under the payment pause and pause payments continue to count towards PSLF eligibility, it is in your accurate to say that a borrower must stop postponing payments in order to make qualifying payments. Although the form goes on to state that a borrower doesn't need to remove their loans from the payment pause, this creates confusing inconsistency. We have joined partners like the National Education Association and the Debt Collective to request that the de department revise this language and explain unequivocally that loans and administrative forbearance under the payment pause remain eligible for forgiveness and that paused payments count towards eligibility. Um, if you choose to use the PSLF help tool to complete your application, many borrowers are unsure on how to proceed when they get to this, uh, the question on this side, on this slide. So if you think that you have already made over 120 payments, the PSLF help tool might not let you choose that option. Um, and that is okay. Just ignore it and choose, no, I haven't made 120 qualifying payments and move on. Don't let this question hold you up from taking the necessary steps to receive the benefits of the PSLF waiver. No matter what you select, um, your account will still be reviewed in full by the Department of Education. And then finally, from what we have seen, um, notices with inaccurate PSLF payments, uh, payment counts have been one of the biggest sources of confusion with the PSLF help tool. So if you're consolidating an older fell loan in order to take advantage of the PSLF waiver, you'll, need to re you'll receive a letter from Fed Loan Servicing after the consolidation is complete noting that you have one qualifying PSLF payment. Don't worry when you receive this letter. Here is what is actually happening. This is an auto-generated letter that is hard-coded to review um, under the standard PSLF program, when we reviewed it, uh, which we reviewed at the beginning of the presentation. So when you consolidate your loans, you'll be asked if you're going to take advantage of PSLF. Um, since you're consolidating for the purposes of PSLF, you'll say yes, um, and after your consolidation is complete, Fed Loan Servicing will notify the Department of Education who will review your account to determine how many qualifying payments you've made towards PSLF. Um, you'll then receive a second letter from Fed Loan um, saying how many payments you have towards the waiver. And as I mentioned before, this process can take a few weeks um, to a few months to complete, and the department does these in batches. So there's no concrete timeline for when you might receive um, notice. Okay, um, so let's review some important takeaways. Um, all right, so don't forget that credit will be given for months during which any loan uh, your loan was in um, repayment status and not in default deferment or forbearance. The deadline is October 31st, 2022 to submit your forms and also consolidate your loans if necessary. And then remember to go through the steps um, in order to take advantage of the waiver. So you'll, you'll, you should confirm your employer, confirm your loan types, consolidate your loans if necessary, and then submit PSLF forms um, for any employment that you think qualifies since October 1st of 2007. Um, and then certainly if you experience any issues, um, please file a complaint with the federal ombudsperson, or if you have um, an ombudsperson in your state, you can also um, submit any complaints to them as well. Okay, um, so thank you very much. I think now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Beth, uh, to share her story. Hi, I'm Beth Borden and I'm a public defender in Florida. I had F FFEL or FEL loans and I had been paying on those since somewhere around June of 2008. And I never qualified for anything. So when the payment pause occurred and when that went to 0% interest during the pause period, that didn't apply to me. I was making my payments all through COVID. And then one day, I think I got a DM on Twitter from Thomas of the Debt Collective telling me, hey, there's this new waiver and I think that you might qualify. So I took a look at it and the first thing I had to do was consolidate my loans from the fell loans to a direct loan. And I was really concerned about it because everything that I knew meant that if I did that, the entire time that I've been paying since 2008 was going to just start all over. And if this didn't work for me, then I was starting from scratch on a new 10 year period. So I was really concerned about that, but 
I took a leap of faith and I did that and that um, came through in November. And once that came through in November, then I went to use the PSL tool to help me fill out the form. And um, so I clicked, I have 120 payments. And as you saw on one of the slides, um, I got a notice that said, are you sure? And it wouldn't let me go forward. So I had to click no, and then I had to alter the box myself on the form once the form printed. And I gave my forms to my employer. One issue that I had is I had been working at my employer from 2005 until 2014. I left for two years and went back in 2016 until now. And there's just nowhere on the form for you to be able to put in those two ranges of dates. So um, my office, when they filled it out, put on there, um, they typed it in in a way that both of those date ranges were on one form instead of submitting two. So I submitted my forms and I got a rejection letter. And I also had um, several weird things that showed that some of my time qualified as, as being with a qualifying employer and some of it didn't. And um, I got that letter that said that there's only one payment and I had 119 to go. And it was really, really frustrating. And then I submitted new forms at the suggestion of the Student Borrower Protection Center and the Debt Collective. So I submitted two separate forms. And then about a month later, um, I just checked the Fed loan site obsessively a month later, I went on there and my debt showed a zero, but I didn't have any letter or anything telling me that my debt had been forgiven. And so it, at first I was like, oh my gosh, you know, did Fed Loan just sell my loan to someone else because they aren't going to service it anymore? And then the more looking around I did, I realized, this, no, you know, this, my whole debt has been forgiven. And they did send me a letter two days later. Um, so for those two days that I was waiting on the letter, I was like, well, I'm fairly certain I have it, but there was just a tiny part of me that was still a little concerned, but um, I had borrowed $55,000. I paid somewhere around $66,000 and $57,000 was forgiven on, on February the 15th of this year. So um, I just, I can't think the Debt Collective and Student Borrower Protection Center enough for all the help that they gave me. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Thomas of the Debt Collective. Okay, I'm gonna be super brief because I want to get uh, as much time as possible to questions and answers. Um, and Amy or Kat, can we put the, the Debt Collective slides up really quick? Uh, I really wanna thank Nick and Beth and the Student Borrower Protection Center for um, doing this. Uh, you know, one of the things I like about Beth's story is that is it is this a is this a story of public service loan forgiveness failing or succeeding? And it's kind of both. Um, we know that they sort they make us fight for every penny. Um, so the. The Debt Collective is a, a new kind of union. It's a debtor's union, uh, it's sort of modeled on a worker's union, organizing debtors around their creditors. Uh, if you aren't a member, I would encourage you to join. We do have a $0 membership option because we know we're organizing poor people who sometimes can't come up with a, a small amount for dues. Um, if, if you wanna hit the, the next slide. Um, we know that uh, you know, we're fighting for full cancellation for everyone uh, beyond these sort of targeted approaches. So if you live near Washington DC, uh, or if you can get yourself to Washington DC at noon on April 4th, uh, we are going to be holding a debtors assembly, a rally uh, to force uh, um, full cancellation for, for everyone. Uh, so you can head to that bit.ly link, pick up the Penjo, and uh, please join us. We have everything to fight for. We have everything to win, but we are only going to win what we organize for. Uh, if you want to hit the next slide. 
Uh, for those of you who live in these cities, we are organizing buses to go to uh, Washington, DC. And uh, I can't promise you a seat on the bus because I know that they are filling up fast. But if you can commit to going, and only if you can commit to going, um, and you would like a free ride on the bus, uh, please head to that bit.ly link, uh, get on the bus DC. And if there is a spot available, we would love to have you uh, join us. Uh, and the next slide. Um, you know, we are fighting for full cancellation and we know that Joe Biden can cancel all federal student loans with a signature. We even wrote the executive order for him. Uh, you can find it yourself, you can print it out, you can mail it to him. Uh, it's just a sort of a fun device, but we really are just one signature away from canceling all federal student loans. Uh, and next slide. Uh, so I can't go into this too deeply, but uh, right now they are threatening to restart student loan payments on May Day, and we're gonna make sure that that never happens. Uh, uh, we are organizing a student debt strike that you can go to at um, bit.ly slash student debt strike. I do wanna clarify, we are not asking anyone to default on their student loans. We're asking people to get to $0 payments in a safe way. There's more information on the website. And the best way to strike your debt is to get it canceled. So if you are uh, applying for public service loan forgiveness, that is one of the ways to join the strike. So. So please join the strike. Uh, and then I think we've got one more slide. Uh, we did write this, uh, this manifesto, Can't Pay, Won't Pay. Uh, if you want to read it, uh, you can check it out from Haymarket Books. Uh, the Debt Collective is focused beyond just student debt. We are um, trying to, to get rid of all debt for basic needs. So we think medical debt, payday loans, things like that just simply should not exist. Um, and I think the last thing I would close by saying is that so far 100,000 people have gotten their debt canceled through public service loan forgiveness, and it would not have happened without groups like the Student Borrower Protection Center, uh, policy advocates who showed how this path could be opened up and are trying to shepherd as many people through. So as you get your debt canceled, make sure to go back and thank the Student Borrower Protection Center and elevate the other work they're doing because they're doing amazing work. Uh, and with that, I, I think we should just get to question and answers. Yeah, thank you so much for joining and thank you, Thomas and um, Beth and Nick for sharing your stories and thank you to the Deck Collective for co-hosting this with us. Um, so we are going to get to as many questions as possible and Kat has been helping to compile uh, some of those in the background during the presentation. Uh, so thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much, Amy. I just wanted to take a quick second to echo all of her things. I won't name everyone, but just seconding it so we can have as much time as possible for questions. One thing I'm just going to mention up top before I start asking Amy, Amy questions, just a reminder, this will be shared. Um, a recording of this presentation will be shared after. We've gotten a lot of questions about going back through some of the information. We also have a website, Forgive My Student Debt, um, that we worked on with many of our, our labor partners that also walks these steps one by one. So we're gonna share that after today's presentation. So just letting you know that she will get a recording and also a website that has uh, many of these answers and resources on it after the webinar. Um, so the first question we've gotten, Amy, we've gotten a couple of people who've either already tried applying to the waiver or submitted paperwork during the waiver, but have yet to hear back. Can you talk a little bit about the timing and when people should expect to hear back about the waiver? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you've already applied, um, you know, your consolidation application, if you had to consolidate your loans, that process is usually a little bit quicker than um, the, the actual PSLF application, the actual PSLF forms getting um, approved. And so, um, you know, it could take a few weeks or a few months for the, your PSLF forms to get approved because they do these in batches. So there's no direct timeline for exactly when it'll happen. Um, but uh, I would just stay vigilant. And, you know, if something doesn't happen um, within a few months, maybe then you could check back and, and, and make sure that um, your paperwork was submitted properly. Awesome, thanks, Amy. Um, we've also gotten questions. So I know we've talked a lot about what people should do if they know they already have 120 payments, 
But does this waiver also benefit people who have yet to reach their full 10 years of public service? Absolutely. So you don't have to wait for your 10 years um, of payments in order to apply. So if you currently work for a nonprofit or work for a government agency, but you've only worked there for a couple of years, um, you can absolutely apply for public service loan forgiveness and follow the steps in this presentation of, um, you know, checking that your loans are eligible or consolidating them if necessary, and then submitting um, your PSLF form uh, or multiple forms um, for, you know, however many years you've worked. Um, in order to start accruing credits towards it, you don't need to wait until the 10 years is up in order to, to apply. And, and um, also I should mention that any credit that you receive during this waiver period will also be added to any credit you receive after the waiver period. So these, these credits are permanent um, and uh, you can continue to accrue credits after the waiver period. Um, and so somewhat of a follow-up to this, um, what about for people who no longer work in public service? So either someone who is retired or getting ready to retire or someone who may have previously worked 10 years in um, the public sector, but now is working in the private sector, are there benefits to this program for them? Yeah, absolutely. So if you currently aren't working for public um, for a public service employer, but you did previously and say you worked for them for 10 years or over 10 years, um, you can still follow these steps and, and submit PSLF forms for any um, qualifying public service employment that you think is eligible. Um, so, you know, say you worked for five years at a, um, a nonprofit and then you worked another five years at a government agency, you could submit those to PSLF forms um, to receive your, your 120, um, you know, qualifying payments, um, your credits towards forgiveness. Um, so, and then, you know, another thing to mention too, again, is that these payments don't need, or I'm sorry, the qualifying public service work doesn't need to be consecutive. So if you move to the private sector for a little while and then came back to public service, you can still submit forms for that public service work. The work doesn't need to be consecutive. Um, and then Amy, what about people who have parent plus loans? Are there ways that they could benefit from this waiver? So in general, parent plus loans do qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Um, but during, but unfortunately, they don't qualify under the waiver. And so, um, one way to to change that or to to make it work um, would be to consolidate your Parent Plus loan with a loan that you took out for your own education. Um, and that, in that case, you know, you could qualify under the waiver um, with Parent Plus loans. Um, but in general, they do qualify for PSLF, just not during the waiver period. Thanks, Amy. And what about private loans? Yeah, um, this is a great question. So if you were, we're talking specifically here about um, federal student loans, so loans that are owned by the federal government. Um, so if you have private loans with a bank or a different company, or if you um, have previously refinanced your loans with a private company, um, unfortunately, the waiver doesn't apply for, for people with private loans. Um, this is specific to federal loans, unfortunately. And then Amy, um, what about, can you talk a little bit about um, payments that may have been in forbearance, deferment, or default and whether or not those count um, for qualifying PSLF payments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so any payment that has been in re, or I'm sorry, any, um, for any month that you've been in repayment status, um, even if you didn't make a payment. So say your income was very low and, and you qualified for a $0 a month payment. Um, because your loan was in repayment status, that month um, would count towards loan forgiveness under PSLF. Um, if you were in an elected, you know, deferment, default, or forbearance, or, you know, if you were in deferment, default, or forbearance, those months wouldn't count towards public service loan forgiveness. Um, However, the different there's there's one difference that I want to mention and clear up um, that for any any loan that has been in uh, the forbearance under the payment pause with the federal government, you know, during the the, 19, the COVID nineteen pandemic, those months do count towards federal loan forgiveness. I'm sorry, <laughs> those loans do count towards public service loan forgiveness. Um, so if you were uh, you know, working for a nonprofit the past two years and you weren't making payments because your loans were under the forbearance. Um, under the, you know, under the pandemic, those loan, those months do count towards loan forgiveness. Um, it's just that ones outside of that, like any default defer, deferment or forbearance outside of the, those months uh, would not count towards PSLF. Thanks, Amy. Um, 
also we've we've gotten a couple of people who've asked um who may have either previously consolidated a feller perkins loan um now with the waiver can they get credit for the payments that they made prior to their original fell or perkins consolidation like so say someone consolidated their feller perkins loans in 2019 can they now get credit for the payments that they made prior to that point through the waiver yeah um they could submit pslf forms for any qualifying employment since um that date of october 1st 2007 so um there are a lot of dates in October to remember, but <laughs> that one in October of 2007 is important. So um, if you already qualify, or I'm sorry, if you already consolidated your loans um, previous to this waiver and you want to, um, you know, add on the credits that you could receive because you had qualifying employment from before that date that you consolidated, you could submit PSLF forms for those employers um, and receive credit for, for that work. And then Amy, we've also gotten a couple of questions about spousal consolidation loans. Can you let us know, do those qualify for PSLF? Um, I actually, uh, I'm not sure, Kat, can you but, help out? So right now, no, no, unfortunately they do not, but I just wanted to make sure for people, there are a couple of questions there. That's one of the things with the waiver um, and generally that, um, that currently don't count. Um, Thank you. And then, um, for the next question, um, we've gotten a couple of questions about people who need verifica verification of their employment. Um, so either they have an employer that they may not be able to get to sign because either that employer may no longer exist or they just can't get them to respond about signing it. Um, is there a way for them to still verify their employment? Yeah, absolutely. So if you have a an employer that no longer exists because they closed down, or if you have an employer that's unwilling or unable to, you know, you can't reach them or they're unwilling to sign the form, there is a box on um, the PSLF form um, that either, you know, that states that either your employment, um, your employer no longer exists or they're refusing to sign the form. So you can check that box and still submit the paperwork, even if they won't sign the form. Um, they might, you know, the Department of Education could ask for um, more information on like to prove that you worked for that organization um, as a follow up to that, but there is a way to get around not being able to get a signature on your form. Thanks, Amy. Um, and then also um, for questions about people who are trying to find their employers EIN, where can they look for that? Yeah, um, you could find it on your W-2 if you have um, your W-2. Um, for some organizations, you could you could Google them. Um, I don't know if you all have ever used um, uh, GuideStar, but you know if you look at an organization's uh, 990, you could also find it there. Um, so there are a few ways, or you could ask your employer as well. There, there are a few ways to go about finding it. Thanks, Amy. Um, Amy, before we go on to the next question, I just wanted to follow up. There was someone who asked a question about um, people who might um, fill out, a, who have a 1099, um, how can they submit paperwork to, for, for example, like income driven repayment plans. There's something called alternative documentation where you can still send the, the, the Department of Education, for example, a W, um, not a W-2, but like, for example, a pay stub to, um, to, to validate your employment. So there are other ways outside of a W-2 to submit paperwork for, um, for your employment to the Department of Education. Um, Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and then to the next question, can you talk about um, any potential downsides to consolidation if someone has like an older Fowler Perkins loan? Sure. Um, so if you were, you know, well on your way to achieving debt forgiveness through another program, so if you had been a teacher for a very long time um, and you were close to receiving um, forgiveness through like the teacher um, forgiveness program, or if you, uh, you know, had been in repayment for a very long time and were close and, and had been in um, an income driven repayment plan for 20 or 25 years and you were very close to receiving forgiveness um, under the IDR program that you were in, um, you know, perhaps uh, that might not be the best option for you. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, the 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 benefits are um, are many. You know, if you're going to get your your loans forgiven in ten or, or less than ten years in this in this scenario, and if you qualify. Thanks, Amy. And then also, um, 
Can you talk about for people who, um, when they submit the waiver, who will have more than 120 qualifying payments, will the Department of Education issue any refunds? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so if you made over 120 pay qualifying payments on direct loans specifically, you will um, you will receive you can receive a refund from the, the Department of Education for those payments. Um, however, if you didn't if you didn't yet um, consolidate or all of your loans weren't direct loans, then you wouldn't receive a refund for those payments that were over 120 qualifying payments. Thanks, Amy. Um, and then, but for people who may have already paid off their loans or pay, paid off partial loans, so they might have paid one of their older loans but still have other loans, do you get credit for loans that you've already paid off? Unfortunately, you don't. Um, if, yeah, if you've already paid off your loans, um, unfortunately, there's no option to receive a refund for those payments. Um, and then also, we have a question. Are there any kind of salary caps for PSLF for getting an income-driven repayment plan? No, there are no salary caps for PSLF or for income-driven repayment. Um, and, and just one note on the income-driven repayment plans, they're all different. And so I mentioned four different um, kinds. I mentioned ICR, IBR, pay, and repay. And they're all different, and they all have different um, you know, parameters around them. And so um, when you're on that page and when you're wanting to, to choose an IDR plan, you're gonna wanna pick the plan that's right for you. Um, remember that the amount that you're paying each month doesn't matter. So you you know, you know likely wanna choose a, a payment plan um, that has the lowest payment that is available to you, right? When you're um, applying. So um, there's, an, there's, a, there's an estimator for how much your payments will be um, on a monthly ba basis when you um, are filling out the, are you, when you're in the PSLF help tool and, and um, choosing an IDR plan. So you wanna pay attention to how much they're asking you to pay each month um, and, and what that looks like. And if there are any other parameters around them that you might wanna consider, like um, you know, if you're married and you file your taxes jointly or, or separately. So you wanna pay attention to all those things when you're choosing a plan and really choose the plan that's right for you because all four of those are eligible for PSLF and it's just about um, whatever is the best one for you. Thanks, Amy. Um, and again, Another question, um, also just a note, can you repeat a little bit? We had a question about consolidating direct loans. So again, people who may have taken out the direct loans at different times, so someone might have um, two sets of direct loans. One is a lot older than the other. Can you talk a little bit about why someone may or may not want to consolidate the loans in, in that scenario? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, uh, direct loans qualify for public service loan forgiveness. If you don't have a direct loan and you have a fall loan or a Perkins loan or both, um, you'll need to consolidate them, them in order to um, up, you know, apply for PSLF. However, if you have a direct loan or say you have multiple direct loans on different timelines, so say you went to college and you took out a direct loan and then you went to grad school later after a few years of working and you took out another direct loan, um, you know, those all already qualify for PSLF, but if you consolidated them all together, they would be on the same timeline as your oldest loan. Um, so you could gain, you know, many years of payments or credit towards payments um, for uh, loan forgiveness if you consolidated your loans um, together, even if they were already direct loans and already qualified. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm going through to make sure we get all the questions, so um, bear with me for a second. Um, we have one note, and Amy, I might give you some follow-up here, but someone's asking, how can um, veterans get a certified signature? Yeah, and if you don't mind helping out with that one, that would be great. Yeah, awesome. What I will say is I, um, I don't have as much background on this, but I did want to give a plug specifically for, um, for veterans and service members. We're having another webinar on April 19th, specifically for, um, for service members and veterans. And so we have some people who like um, have more specified information on this. So we'll also share that information after today's call. But one thing I do wanna know is that sometimes people um, are able to submit DD-214s. I'm not as familiar <laughs> with the process, but I, I'm not sure if it's official policy, but I've heard that that is one way, but then also one other thing to note. Um, also, um, Amy mentioned a bit about um, forbearances. That does, 
active forbearance during active duty periods do count. So um, just another reminder. So again, the COVID payment pause, those periods count towards PSLF. Also um, periods for active duty, um, those also counts. Just wanted to flag that. Um, Thanks, Kat, that's really helpful. Um, Amy, we have a couple questions about how people can find how many credits they currently have towards PSLF. Do you mind? Yeah, sure. Um, so if you are already in the program and you're, you're in that case, your uh, servicer should be Fed Loan Servicing. There is uh, there, there's a toolbar on the left and um, it should say like public service loan forgiveness. Um, and so if you click on that, it should show you your current um, credit count for how many credits you've received towards PSLF to date. Um, so that's a way that you can find that out. Thanks, Amy. Um, and then do you mind explaining um, the 30 hour require requirement again? So either if someone has multiple part time jobs or um, their employer's designation of full time might be different than 30 hours. Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Department of Education defines um, full time as 30 hours a week um, or whatever is greater. If, if your employer deems, um, you know, 35 hours a week is full-time, then that is the number that they're going to go with. Um, so it's either 30 hours a week or whatever your employer deems is full-time if it's greater than 30 hours a week. Um, and then if you have multiple part-time jobs, those part-time jobs just need to add up to 30 hours a week. So you could work, you know, 20 hours at a nonprofit and then 10 hours at a government agency or at multiple nonprofits in order to reach that 30 hours a week. That's a good question. And then, um, Amy, I know we talked a little bit about IDR, but do you mind clarifying again? So if someone has a $0 payment under IDR, does that count as a qualifying payment? Yes, so as long as the loan, the loan is in repayment status, um, and if you're in an IDR plan, um, and and you know that that monthly payment set by the RDA, IDR plan is zero dollars a month, that that payment can absolutely count towards your credit towards loan forgiveness in that scenario. Absolutely. Um, Alrighty, so we probably only have time for maybe one or two more questions. I'm going to try to get something that we've gotten quite a few questions about. Um, We've gotten a couple of questions about how often people should be submitting their um, PSLF forms and if they need to submit a separate form for each employer. Um, do you mind clarifying that? Sure. Um, so because um, there have been issues with the program in the past, we recommend that people um, apply for public service loan forgiveness as soon as um, you know that you want to. <laughs> and then also every year um, that you're working for a public service employer, and then every time you change jobs from one employer to another, um, yeah, yep. You can. You don't have to do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. You don't have to do this. You could do this after 10 years of um, employment. But this is a great way to catch any issues that come up. Um, you know, if if there are issues that arise. And then um, one part question. Trying to make sure I get. Um, Oh, Brady. Um, I feel like we've gotten quite a few of these, but I want to make sure we're um, getting as many questions as possible before we, we end out. Um, while, while looking through um, some of these questions, just to make sure we can get um, as many as possible, just a reminder, after the webinar, we're going to share our website, forgivemystudentdebt.org, um, um, that also has a lot of this information that Amy went through today in addition to a recording of the webinar. Also, we know there are quite a few people who wanted to participate um, in today's webinar who couldn't join. So again, the recording will be shared, but we do host monthly webinars at the SVPC. So if you know others that might be able to benefit from PSLF or are interested in learning more, we'll have one at least every month until October and we'll share those um, so that can be shared. Um, Amy, one more time, do you just mind repeating, we've got a, a lot of questions about, um, about timing. Can you just, again, share that about when people should prepare, expect to hear back? Sure, yeah. So unfortunately, there is no exact timeline for when you might hear. Um, typically, if you have to consolidate your loans, that process will be a little bit quicker. Maybe that would be like a month. I'm just guesstimating here. This isn't an exact science. 
Um, but that is a quicker process than um, the uh, going through all of the PSL forms that are submitted. And so the Department of Education has said that they're doing this on a rolling basis and they're doing it in batches. So, um, you know, they'll have like a grouping of applications that they'll approve and, and kind of administer all the credits to at once. Um, and so unfortunately there's no exact timeline. Um, it could be a few weeks, it could be a few months. Um, yeah, so unfortunately I can't, I can't um, give an exact answer to when you might get approved. Thanks, Amy. And then just one last question. We've gotten a couple of questions about, um, for example, um, people's actual employment status. So um, for public service loan forgiveness, so we've gotten a couple of questions, for example, if someone works for a contractor or um, you, what role you do in a certain job for PSLF, it doesn't matter what your job is, it's about who your employer is. So, um, if your employer is the, the nonprofit, the 501c3, the government organization, you would qualify. But if you, for example, if you work for a private contractor with, for example, the federal government or a private contractor with the nonprofit, um, your employer is whoever, whoever essentially sends you your W-2. So that's how you kind of determine, is it the nonprofit that I contract with or the contracting service that I work for? Similarly, we got a question, someone's, for example, do my periods of leave on work count? If you're on leave, um, as long as you're still employed and you have, you're in, in repayment status, that counts. It doesn't matter that you might not necessarily be in the office. It's more about, um, again, who is your employer? And then are you in active repayment? Um, but Amy, I will hand it back to you, but thank you all so much for, for attending this evening. Yeah, thank you so much for um, coming tonight. I hope it was helpful. Thank you to the Debt Collective for co-hosting this with us. And thank you to Beth and Nick for sharing your stories. Um, we hope to see you at some more webinars and we hope that um, this will be helpful in applying for your own forgiveness. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you.